Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in olieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mate Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hor motis nostre. Amen. In nobre pacis et fili, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Carissimi beloved in Christ, welcome to this broadcast mass on this, as we said, the octave day of the Feast of the Epiphany. Epiphany, of course, means revelation, manifestation. And on this, the octave day, we recall the great theophany, the great revelation, manifestation, epiphany of the triune Godhead, the Blessed Trinity, which occurred on the baptism of Jesus. You may recall that during uh, this octave we have reflected at various times in our homilies on uh, the various different theophanies, the various different revelations, particularly, of course, of the revelation of the incarnation of the theophany of God made man, of the Word made flesh in Christ. And particularly, of course, our focus was on the visitation of the Magi, they who had seen and read uh, the signs and portents and the prophecies fulfilled of the coming Messiah and had made that journey all the way from the east, from the ancient kingdom of Persia to Israel, to Bethlehem via Jerusalem, there to meet, greet and adore God made man. They, as it were, were heralds too of that appearing, announcing as they did to the scribes, the Pharisees, and the priests in Jerusalem, and, of course, Herod. The third theme of Epiphany, the Theophany, the revelation of Christ's divinity in the working of his first public miracle at the wedding of Cana in Galilee, that will be commemorated this Sunday. But this octave day of the Epiphany recalls the baptism of Jesus and the great theophany, the great revelation, the only time in Scripture where the three distinct persons of the Blessed Trinity appear at the same time and in one place. As we said the other day, of course, the triune Godhead, wherever one is, the other two are, but in the other theophanies recorded, for example, in the Old Testament, when the triune God appeared, for example, to Moses, they came in one form together. They appeared in one guise together. For Moses, of course, in the form of the burning bush. This is the only occasion where theophany happens. God appears, reveals himself, but in his three distinct persons. At the baptism of Jesus, we see Jesus in the River Jordan, we see the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove, and we hear the voice of God say, this is my Son, the Beloved, in whom I am well pleased. St John's Gospel, read to us today, is presented to us not because of necessarily its narrative but of course always with St John it is rich in theology just like the prologue to St John's Gospel that which we generally read as the last gospel all of St John's Gospel is rather than presenting a historical narrative or chronology, is more of a theological presentation and perspective. Oh yes, of course, wound up, bound up with the retelling of various significant events. But St John is keen, as it were, to emphasize the theology, to emphasize the revelation of God that is in Christ, that is in uh, the gospel message. So it is that St. John presents to us, or rather Holy Church presents to us via St. John, the testimony 
of the Baptist. And there are a couple of things I hope that might have struck you about the Baptist's testimony. I hope that you recognised the words of invitation that we hear now to Holy Communion, to the Theophany, the revelation of God made flesh, body, blood, soul and divinity in the Holy Eucharist. When we hear at the beginning of this Gospel pericope, Etre Agnus Dei, Etre Quitoret Peccatum Mundi. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. These words that have been eternalized by the Holy Liturgy are a confession, of course, of who Christ is as the Messiah. And John's exclamation in testimony is given for the benefit of whom? But his disciples. Among them, of course, we know, was Andrew, the brother of Simon, son of Jonah, who would become called Peter. Those who were seekers after truth had been following the Baptist, becoming his disciples, assisting him in his mission of preparing the way for the Lord. His ministry of baptism and repentance had one objective, one reason, one purpose, to prepare people to receive the Messiah, to receive salvation. You may perhaps have been struck by the words of the Baptist when he said, I myself did not know who he was, although the very reason why I have come with my baptism of water is to make him known to Israel. This may strike you as odd because of the close relationship we know between John and Jesus by blood. Their mothers, of course, were cousins. We know that John leapt in his mother Elizabeth's womb when they heard the greeting of Our Lady when she visited Elizabeth after the Annunciation. But here remember that the Baptist is testifying is testifying for the benefit of his disciples, for his followers. And it may be, of course, that the Baptist had not always realised quite who his cousin was. For sure, he might have known that Jesus was indeed special. Indeed, that Jesus had some special divine purpose and vocation, just as John did. But John may not have realised himself exactly what that mission and purpose was until this moment. Till then, I did not know him. But then I remembered what I had been told by the God who sent me to baptize with water. He told me, the man who will baptize with the Holy Spirit is the man on whom thou wilt see the Spirit come down and rest. Here again. St. John is testifying for the benefit of his followers for his disciples. 
confirming, affirming. That he witnessed and saw the Holy Spirit at Christ's baptism. I saw the Spirit coming down from heaven like a dove and resting upon him. This John knew then to be the sign. This then confirmed for John that Jesus was the Messiah. This then suggests to us the prudence of the Baptist. He relies upon the prophecy. He relies upon revelation. He relies upon what God has revealed and what God has made known. And there, my brothers and sisters, is a lesson for us who likewise are called to exercise and manifest the virtue of prudence. Who are extolled by the Apostle to discern the spirits. Not everyone and everything that says it's of itself that it is of God is necessarily so. Remember at the time of Jesus, there have been many false prophets and many false messiahs. And the apostle elsewhere warns us, admonishes us to hold fast to what we know to be true, even and despite the apparition of a heavenly being. For if they say anything contrary to what we already know, what we already has been, or what already has been made known, they have come from the deceiver, not from God. And this is why, for us as Orthodox Catholics, We apply that ready rule of thumb, that ready reckoner, that canon of St. Vincent of Lerins to be sure to identify that which is the right belief, the orthodox doctrine. The Catholic faith is that which has been believed always and everywhere by all. in the craziness and topsy-turviness that is today's world. This, my brothers and sisters, is an important lesson, an important reminder to us to be prudent and to exercise prudence. For as Jesus forewarned, there will be many, and there are, running around now, preaching doom and gloom, prophesying the end of the world, false Christs are beginning to appear, people claiming to have divine knowledge, but which is contrary to divine revelation. Remember, Christ himself told us, don't pay attention to such. Don't get carried away with such. There will be those who say, the Christ is returned here. You know, he is returned there. Jesus says, you know, you will know when the Son of Man returns, when the sky is split, riven from east to west, and the Son of God arrives in a great chariot preceded by a horde of the heavenly host, 
pouring and spreading out over the face of the earth, sorting the goats from the sheep, the chiff from the chaff. Until then, our Lord says, focus on your salvation, focus on loving God and loving neighbour. Pay no heed to the tinfoil hat brigades. Use prudence. Use your ability to rationalise. Don't give in to emotions. Don't get carried away. But keep yourself centred and calm, rooted, steadfast in that which has been divinely revealed. That which has been always believed everywhere and by all. The testimony contained that single deposit of the faith once delivered to the saints, the word made flesh to the apostles, the sacred scriptures. And John, of course, the Baptist, in his testimony, speaks to the Holy Spirit. And here, my brothers and sisters, is where we really should exercise prudence. For how many have told us in recent years that the Holy Spirit has inspired them to this or to that, even though this or that directly contradicts the divine revelation. How many have claimed the Holy Spirit for this or that change? How many have claimed the Holy Spirit to tear up traditions and tradition itself? To attack the constancy and reliability of divine revelation? and the apostolic faith. For 500 years, others have claimed to be the church. And yet what is missing that the Baptist himself recognises is necessary to confirm and affirm that which is truly of God. The presence of the Holy Spirit. Where is the Holy Spirit? Where is the evidence for the continuing advocacy of the Holy Spirit with Christ's true church and body of Christ on earth. Surely it is with those who have the ability to share in the miracle of the Incarnation at Bethlehem. They who have the ability to receive the new bread from heaven that gives eternal life. They who are anointed and consecrated for whom the Holy Spirit is promised 
and confirmed and affirmed by the power of grace and sanctity that is exercised within the body of Christ. Who have the Eucharistic miracles that prove the truth, the veracity of Christ's words, institutional and commanding? Who receives his body? Who receives his blood? Who has borne witness and has witnesses too? the transformation of bread and wine into the body and blood who has grown swathes of saints Who have taught and inspired by word and by action and have proven their salvation by the efficacy of their continued intercession. Even my brothers and sisters in the early church, there were others who claimed to exercise power, to exercise and manifest miracles. But it was only from the apostles that the church grew. Who, as the succession of the apostles today, who maintains the same faith, the same belief, the same practice as the Apostles. They who still profess and believe that which has always been believed everywhere and by all for 2,000 years. It is clear where the Holy Spirit resides. In Christ's baptism is instituted our own baptism. The Baptist's baptism is made whole, completed for the invitation to receive salvation is to be baptized with water and the Spirit. <clears throat> 
Christ by his baptism enables us to share with him eternal life with God. The baptism that we receive enables us to become children of God. For in Christ's baptism, he sanctifies that element of water which had already been used by God in signs and wonders and portents, prefiguring the salvation that it would afford. Author itself has been connected with theophanies. Think of creation and the waters of creation and the Spirit of God. Think of the great flood and the purgation, the purifying of the world by water. The restoration of the world by water. Remember the parting of the Red Sea, salvation that comes through water. Think of the riven, flop, the riven rock and the flowing water outpouring mercy. Think of the water likewise that poured forth from the side of Jesus on the cross. All these things speak to and ultimately derive from this event. This sanctification by Christ of the world, this restoration of creation. In this moment of Christ's baptism, all these events are brought together. As Christ, the incarnate Son of God, stands in the waters of the River Jordan, So the restoration of creation begins. So the possibility of salvation begins.
So the realization of God's love. is made manifest. In the offertory today, we will pray. Lord, we bring these sacrificial offerings in remembrance of thy newborn Son's manifestation, humbly making our petition that he, Jesus Christ our Lord, the creator of our gifts, may accept them and have mercy, who is God. The creator of our gifts, the author of our life, the saviour of our souls. Can we offer him? As the carol beautifully puts it, I give him my heart. We can only give him, we can only offer our thanksgiving, we can only offer our love, that single thing which is and can be and should be and is of our own will. Everything else is of God and from God. The only thing we can offer God is our love. And that love, my brothers and sisters, of course, needs itself to be manifested, needs itself to be revealed. And what greater love could be revealed in each and every one of us than the love of God for others. As we reflected the other day, true love does not love for love's itself sake, but loves selflessly. We are called to share, to share God's love, but not only his love, but to share and make known his love through our own love, through marrying our love with his love. It's not enough for us to simply talk about God's love. It's not simply enough 
to be motivated by God's love to show mercy and generosity to others for our acts to be true love they must come from us we must love we must desire to love it is our love married with his love that will reveal him in with and through us Let us pray, my brothers and sisters, today that we might strive with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength, availing ourselves of the guarantee, presence and promise, confirmation and affirmation of the Holy Spirit in the Church. especially availing ourselves of the assured means of grace, of sanctifying grace in the sacraments and by opening our hearts and our minds and being receptive to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. but so that we may love as God loves in Jesus. That we may be changed and transformed from within to change and transform without. That we may become for ourselves vessels, vehicles, mediums of theophany for others. That as we grow in holiness, as we experience theosis, divinization, sanctification, holiness, we may become icons of theophany. And be the sparks of epiphany. That others may see Christ in us and be drawn to him through us. And come to know for themselves God's love. and realize their salvation in him who is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.